frail man, old before his years, is making a journey in flight. His work from the past 20 years has been overturned. He's rejected. He's been imprisoned. Now free, he's an enemy of the state, and he's blind. Plague ravages London, his home city. He's got to get out. It could be a sad end, weren't it, for the fact that this man has just finished writing the greatest poem in the English language. He is John Milton, and the poem is called Paradise Lost. I'm convinced that John Milton is our nation's greatest poet. Excuse me. A pretty extensive field research on a bridge reveals... Who's that? No, I didn't. ..that most people... No. ..can't even recognise the poor chap. Do you recognise that man? No. If I were to say John Milton to you, do you what no. comes into your head? Nothing. Not a thing. Has anyone here heard of John Milton? Anyone? OK, Milton is deeply unfashionable. But why? He wrote poetry from a very young age. He spent 20 years at the forefront of radical Republican politics. Then, when his cause failed, he finally created his masterwork, Paradise Lost. It's an impressive CV, although I admit he doesn't look like a bundle of laughs. What image do you have in your head of John Milton? Gloomy. Gloomy? Yes. <laughs> OK. Long-winded. Long-winded. <laughs> miserable. Miserable. What makes you seem miserable? It's the connotation of Paradise Lost, which you think is going to be miserable. I haven't read it, but okay. I think... <laughs> Actually, it's anything but. Paradise Lost is an electrifying poem about love and war, the fight between good and evil, and an obsession with human freedom that speaks to us now. Before I went into comedy, I spent three years as a student at Oxford trying to write a PhD on Paradise Lost. No one was more surprised by that than me. I'd always been interested in the funny writers like Dickens and Swift. To me, John Milton seemed like a funless Protestant who wrote a vast, unread poem about biblical stories no one was interested in anymore. To a fun-loving Catholic like myself, that seemed the last thing I wanted to be spending my student grant on. And then I read Paradise Lost and was instantly dazzled. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe. With loss of Eden, Till one greater man restore us. And regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse. John Milton mean anything to you? Yep. Yes? Yes? You've heard of John Milton? Of course. When I say John Milton to you... Oh, bless you. Bless you. I've found someone. If I say John Milton to you, what do you think of? Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost. Mm. And have you, uh, have you read Paradise Lost uh -huh. or read it? Yes. And yeah. what, did you, what did you make of that? Full of energy. Absolutely Excellent. wonderful. And I take it from your accent, you're not native born. I'm not native born. Where are you from? I'm an Australian. So we yeah. have to go all the way to Australia to find, find someone who's to infused Absolutely. about John Milton. Absolutely. Standing on this yeah. frozen bridge it's across it's the cold. ice cold Thames. Cold. Well, bless you for remembering him. <laughs> Thank you very well much. I think we should all be celebrating Milton and celebrating his greatest poem. So before we plunge in, here's a little explanation of the great tale that's about to unfold. Paradise Lost is basically a massive, dramatic retelling of the story of Adam and Eve. God makes the world. He makes our first parents, Adam and Eve, and he puts them in charge of the Garden of Eden. He tells them they can do anything apart from eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Satan, a fallen angel, disguises himself as a serpent and comes along and tempts Eve to eat the apple. She then persuades Adam to do so too. God is angry and banishes our first parents from the Garden of Eden. Paradise, it seems, is lost forever. What in me is dark, illumine. What is low, raise and support. That to the height of this great argument. I may assert eternal providence. And justify the ways of God to men.
Milton surprises from the very start. He says he wants to justify the ways of God to men. So we're expecting to hear all about Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. But just a few lines in, we're thrown into a compelling vision of hell. To make it work, Milton coins new words, phrases fresh to the English language. Satanic, pandemonium, stunning. We join Satan, freshly cast out of heaven, examining his new surroundings. At once, as far as angels can, he views the dismal situation, waste and wild, a dungeon horrible, and all sides round as one great furnace flamed, yet from those flames no light, but rather darkness visible. This is one of the most famous passages in Paradise Lost. I remember when I first read it, how memorably dramatic the language seemed. But now the closer you examine it, the more you realize just how booby-trapped Milton's language actually is. At once, as far as angels can, he views. This is Satan. At once, as far as angels can, he views. Now, the sounds there are all very open. It's, it's all about a view, space in front of him. Ah, act. Once, as far as angels can, he views outwards. And then suddenly, because the line doesn't end there, he views the dismal situation. Dismal is like a great big gate coming down. Dismal situation. Waste and wild. A dungeon horrible. It's another gate coming down on all sides round as one great furnace. Flamed, yet from those flames, no light. We're led to believe flames is going to give us something fiery and glittery. No light, but rather, and here's the great surprise, this is where the, the phrase says, rather darkness visible. Darkness visible, that's an extraordinary expression. Darkness visible. We can sort of see the darkness, and yet we know that we can't see it because it's darkness. Milton's language here is so ambiguous. And the same is true of his characterization of Satan, who can seem noble at times, even heroic. When William Blake read Paradise Lost, he wondered if Milton was of the devil's party without knowing it. Blake should have given Milton more credit. He's a lot cleverer than that. One who brings a mind, this is Satan talking of himself, a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. That's Satan saying, I can take words, words that mean the opposite of each other, and yank them together, and somehow they will impress you, they will make you feel that I've somehow come up with an argument that is persuasive. Make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Here is the start of spin. This is poetry telling us what spin and argument is all about. The, the sort of politician who says, forward to the past. Let us start building our tomorrows today. Victory in defeat. It all sounds great, especially if you do that with your finger and raise your voice, but it is meaningless nonsense. All those people are literally doing the devil's work. And this sort of play with language, this, this use of words without really caring what they mean as long as they sound impressive, even though the words themselves are the opposite of each other, ends up in the sort of pure evil that you see in phrases like work sets you free and the gates of concentration camps. Milton makes us feel that we are not being told that this is wrong or this is bad or this is manipulative. He allows us to work it out for ourselves. From hell we go to heaven via slow. In a porter cabin by the A4, a class of 11-year-olds are gathering to discuss Paradise Lost. I have at last put up all your pictures to do with Milton's description of hell. Now we're going to pick that work up today and we're going to look at the opposite. So what's the opposite of hell? Yeah? Heaven. Milton's not ragingly popular in schools these days. He's often considered too difficult. But I watch this lot relish getting their sleeves rolled up. And I had a brief go at being a teacher's assistant. 
Have you come across any strange words? Yeah. Um, oh, Jubilee. Hang on, I've got my book here. Jubilee is like a big celebration, but I think for someone special. Hosanna. Hosanna. It's like a hooray. It's like an angel saying hooray. We didn't know what raptures were kind of. Ra raptures are sort of, um, if you're really happy, really ecstatic. Yeah. We know all the rest. Though. You know all the rest? Yeah. Oh, well, you don't need me. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, well, I'll leave you to it. You have to start with individual words, of course, but it's the way Milton puts them together that's the really stunning bit. The class, for example, thought it was great that Milton described heaven as having a river of bliss running through it. A river of what? It feels so real. But it, while it feels so real, it's also very difficult to kind of put your finger on, on every little detail. It's like, you know, you came up with this phrase, river of bliss which sounds great, but you can't actually imagine what bliss looks like. So to so have a whole river of it is like unimaginable, and yet it feels real. And I think what I found about Paradise Lost it is it's magical like that. It's, you feel as you're reading it, you sort of know what's going on, and yet the more you think about it, the more you, you, you think of it in different ways, even when you're 78 still see it as something that you're reading for the first time. I'm still learning. I've learned a lot today <laughs> from going around. Thank you, for, thank you for, for teaching me more about Paradise Lost. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming very much. Thank you. They're all happy to make time for the poem in between bouts of Club Penguin and Nintendo Wii Crazy Golf. But what was John Milton doing at their age? Well, Milton was born in the dynamic heart of London here on Bread Street in 1608. His family had to work for the money and they brought their son up in a truly urban environment. It's not overrun with Milton memorials around here now, so I've got to use my imagination a little bit. They're actually constructing a giant 500-foot tower depiction of God. These are God's ankles that we can see. So it's an initiative from Boris Johnson. And there you can see a depiction of hell, uh, the lower regions, the massed ranks of the fallen, um, living in a sort of an eternal torment of pain and sadness, I think, really. Ah, at last, a sign, John Milton Passage. And there, there it is. <laughs> it's, basically, it's basically an office underpass. Or, or the road to hell, as I, I, I like to think of it. OK, so it's all corporate and thrusting and run on money that simply doesn't exist. But it's still full of activity around here. Not that different from the London Milton grew up in, really. Down there, across, round the corner there, is St Paul's. Uh, not just the church and the school, but St Paul's at the time was also the great thoroughfare where people would go to gossip. It was the centre of the book trade. It was also the red light district. Um, we had the Blackfriars Theatre further over there where Milton's father was a, a trustee and, and, at the time, Shakespeare was putting on his, his very last plays. Milton's dad was a successful businessman and he had serious ambitions for his little boy. In the middle of his um, massive second defence of the English people, there's a little tantalising glimpse by Milton of his childhood where he writes, uh, My father destined me in early childhood for the study of literature, for which I had so keen an appetite that for my twelfth year scarcely ever did I leave my studies for my bed before the hour of midnight. He spent his, his nights up in his uh, candlelit room, learning French and Italian and Hebrew, studying the Bible, and working his way uh, methodically through all the great uh, English classics of prose and poetry. He was, at that early age, in his own head, trying to um, make himself become the great English poet that he wanted to be. And, and, and this can sometimes add to that image we have of him as someone withdrawn, withdrawn from the world, spreading his days indoors rather than outside. 
but nothing could be further from the truth. There's nothing prissy or priggish about Milton. He believed that poetry should be simple, sensuous and passionate. And that's especially true of his description of the Garden of Eden. It's really quite a randy place. Here's a description of, of Adam and Eve doing the gardening, which you think is quite a, an innocent little activity. Uh, but the description of the trees and the flowers uh, suggests that even they are, have only one thing in their mind. Uh, Were any row of fruit trees over woody reached too far the pampered boughs and needed hands to check fruitless embraces? They led the vine to wed her elm. She spoused about him, twines her marriageable arms. This is just a vine going round an elm tree branch. But it sounds like uh, they're at it like knives. She spoused about him, twines her marriageable arms, and with her brings her dower the adopted clusters to adorn his barren leaves. It's a whole marriage ceremony, just going up a tree. And, and I was looking for another passage, but, but on the way I came across this, which is a description of Eve serving dinner to the archangel Raphael. And it says here, Meanwhile at table Eve ministered naked, and their flowing cups with pleasant liquors crowned. O oh, innocence deserving paradise, if ever then, then had the sons of God excuse to have been enamoured at that sight. But in those hearts love unlibidinous reigned, nor jealousy was understood, the injured lover's hell. That's a description basically of the angels in heaven potentially lusting after Eve. But we're told by Milton that they didn't because uh, they were nice and they hadn't fallen. Milton makes his celestial creatures so human, so tangible. He even dazzles us with details of the angels' digestive systems. The Archangel Raphael comes and visits Adam and Eve in the garden and tells them the story while he sits and has dinner with them. Yes, in Paradise Lost, angels can eat food. There's a description of how food is broken down within angels' digestive tracts and then emitted as a sort of celestial gas. Tasting, concoct, digest, assimilate, and corporeal to incorporeal turn. That's the very first depiction in English literature of angel farts. Now, I don't know how seriously you're meant to take it. Milton is depicting a slightly crazy world. It's a world that's slightly hippie, really. Nothing's quite what it seems. Milton, I think, is, is like some Hollywood producer taking the story of the Bible, the word of God, the word that at that time, when he was writing, he was told, he was indoctrinated to think was literal truth. He's taking that story and he's chucking a lot of it away and rewriting bits of it for himself. He, he's making the Bible in his own image. Now that's an incredibly daring thing to do. It makes it much more human, but it also makes it a little bit more ambitious, arrogant, dangerous. In 1625, John Milton went up to Christ's College, Cambridge. It was a rather boorish place, and Milton, the sensitive poet with long hair, didn't fit in. He hated it, and when he left, he moved back in with mum and dad. And they moved here, Horton in Berkshire. Milton was now a jobless 20-something, living with his parents in the middle of nowhere. Milton wrote to his old school friend, Charles Deodati, that he was having a great time here. He was being given the chance to think, and to read, and to write. Um, but I just wonder whether that's him being slightly too defensive. I'm not sure. I'm not sure he would, sure he would want to have died here. Soon there are signs of restlessness. In an early poem called Lycidas, Milton rages against corruption in the church. Later, he began to loathe the bishops and denounce the interlinking of church and state. Milton wanted to determine his own relationship with God. He didn't want anyone else telling him how it was done. Something happened in Horton that may have stirred him further. 
When his mother died, she was buried here in St Michael's, but the wrong way round. Her gravestone was criticised by Church of England inspectors who wanted to enforce uniformity. But the Miltons never did turn the grave the right way round. I like to think that Milton's contempt for the bishops, which happened round about this time, may well have been the product of theological inquiries going on in his own head and conclusions he'd come to anyway, or may well have been set off by this little petty dispute that was going on, being told that his mother's remains were buried squinty. It can be the personal things that radicalise a young mind and galvanise it against authority. John's mind was bubbling. He needed to get away. So, in May 1638, aged 29, John Milton sailed off in search of himself, making his way to Italy and beginning what must surely have been one of the most pivotal experiences of his life. It was, to use one of Milton's most enduring expressions, a journey to fresh woods and pastures new. The first city he spent any significant amount of time in was Florence. And he was enraptured by it. For Milton to see all this for the first time, especially after coming from where well, you've seen Horton, the contrast must have been startling, I mean, quite dramatic. And here in Florence, suddenly, for Milton, the Bible comes alive. God is built large and painted fresh and vivid in stone and on canvas, but so is flesh, vast pink puddles of flesh painted on Renaissance ceilings and hanging from tapestries and carved from stone in gardens and in public squares. This whole city is a celebration not just of spirituality, but of the human form of humanity in an intensity that Milton would never have experienced before. It must have completely transformed his whole conception of what you could do as an artist. Here, finally, he seems happy. He makes friends. He attends private academies with the city's wits. He reads them poems he's written in Latin and Italian, and they love them. They still do. Giovane piano e semplicetto amante, poiché fuggir me stesso in dubbio sono, Madonna, voi del mio cuor l'umildono farò di voto. Well, thank you very much for reading out the, uh, the well, Milton. It sounded beautiful. It was. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> of course, it was in your honour. I mean, I've, I've got the English translation here. Yes. Since I am a young, simple and candid lover, in doubt how to escape from myself, lady, I will devoutly give you the humble gift of my heart. Yes. So it's very, very sort of romantic. And... It is, it is. It is, uh, it is very romantic yeah. because um, this is a sonnet to not to a real woman, but to love, yes. love itself. That's interesting in that, at that age anyway, his yeah. most passionate stuff, or yes. his most emotional most stuff, emotional. is expressed in other languages. Yes. Probably. Maybe he didn't want people back home to know. <laughs> I what don't kind know. Of a he was. I don't know oh, about that. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> Who knows? Paradise Lost was finally published almost 20 years later but it may have begun life here. Around now, Milton makes some tantalising early notes on Paradise Lost as a five-act drama. He may have been further inspired by an extraordinary meeting. Because in Florence, the young John Milton met old, blind Galileo, the revolutionary astronomer. The meeting may have taken place here at Galileo's villa, but he was under house arrest for challenging the traditional teachings of the Catholic Church. Galileo wasn't afraid of experimenting, of asking difficult questions and offering up answers that shook the establishment. 
I think in that respect, he was a kind of role model for this young poet from England. In Paradise Lost, Milton's depiction of God and the heavens seems almost scientific. It has a curious distancing effect. I'm just looking here at Milton's uh, description of the heavens in Paradise Lost, and it's a very mechanistic, scientific, very rational, physical description of how the heavens work. It's almost like Galileo, he's trying to not only describe but explain the movement of the stars and of the angels. He describes here, Meanwhile, upon the firm, apacious globe of this round world, whose first convex divides the luminous inferior orbs, enclosed from chaos and the inroad of darkness old, Satan alighted walks. Rapacious globe, convex, luminous, inferior orbs. It's like walking through a science museum. And yet this is the description of the division between heaven and hell. The same mechanistic language applies to Milton's characterization of God. Whereas Satan gets all the good speeches, God comes dangerously close to sounding incomprehensible. This is God talking about how if Adam and Eve are going to eat the apple and fall, it's their own fault, not his, even though he knows in advance that they're going to do it. It's all about him trying to explain away his foreknowledge of their uh, sin. And God says, Their will, disposed by absolute decree or high foreknowledge, they themselves decreed their own revolt, not I. If I foreknew, for knowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proved certain unforeknown. I've no idea what that means. Uh, I, I assume you don't either. And I'm not sure you're meant to really. It's a very, very elaborate, long-winded justification by God in very abstract theological language of his whole system. Now, I am intrigued as to why Milton writes about God and heaven like this. It's a little bit dull, really. It's a bit boring. Is it because he feels a little bit guilty about how carried away he got with himself and his own powers and abilities in describing Satan earlier on? He was almost too good at describing evil. And as a penance, as he decided to be a little bit less ostentatious, and describing God. I can't quite accept that. I was once asked on a Radio 4 programme why it was that I, I gave up very, very, very early thoughts of, of becoming a priest. And part of the reason I said was that from my study of theology and religion and, and interest in sort of spiritual matters, no one had actually explained to me why it was that Jesus had to die to save mankind. I'd heard that phrase again and again and again, and in church services it's just assumed that you can understand it, but I, but I couldn't, and yet I couldn't find any actual explanation as to why that happened. And I said on the programme that no doubt in saying that I'd get lots of letters, and uh, I did. And these are all very, very, very well-meaning and understanding attempts to resolve my dilemma. Someone here says, I was surprised to hear you couldn't understand why God had to die for our sins. God doesn't have to do anything. That is what being God means. Another one here that says, um, the short answer is Hebrews 2.14. Someone sent in a diagram. Someone else said, um, please find the enclosed brochure distributed by Jehovah's Witnesses. You'll find the answer on pages six and seven. So the answer to the question is, don't ask the question. Yet in Paradise Lost, that's precisely what Milton does. He's so ambitious, he says he's going to write things that unattempted yet in prose and rhyme. He's going to justify the ways of God to man. And yet he doesn't. His God is a dull God. Is that deliberate? Does Milton write a boring God because God bores him? I wonder whether in the battle in Milton's own head between the theologian and the poet, the poet was beginning to win out. John sailed back to England in 1639, and the rumblings of discontent that had started back in Horton began to get a lot louder. He didn't like the way the country was being run, so he did something about it. He put his poetic ambitions to one side and plunged into politics.
Print was exploding in the 17th century, like the web is today. A revolutionary way to get your message to the masses. Milton seized it by the horns. As the civil war against Charles I gathered on the horizon, he began writing political pamphlets, a one-man opposition interrogating values and challenging beliefs with radical republican thinking. Milton's most famous pamphlet is this, Areopagitica. It's his passionate response to new laws designed to ban the work of pamphleteers like him. Areopagitica is the most perfect expression in the English language of the defense of freedom of speech. It's the greatest attack on state censorship that has ever been written. He starts by arguing, first of all, the books in themselves always have something of intrinsic merit in them. There's a great danger if we ban a book, we might ban something that is vitally important that we just don't know the implications of yet. He says here, books are not absolutely dead things, but do contain a potency of life in them to be as active as that soul was whose progeny they are. And he gets more and more passionate. He argues vociferously for the value of any book there is and in quite a violent and aggressive way, as good, almost, kill a man as kill a good book. Basically what Milton is saying is that our freedom to think, our freedom to engage in political and religious thought is nothing unless we have the ability to meet head on our opponents, unless we are challenged by the opposite point of view. There is no way we can test how firmly we hold our own opinions. Areopagitica is fundamental to Milton's work and to our interpretation of that work because in it, Milton for the very first time manages to articulate what the point of Milton is. It's to write because writing has a point. As battles raged across the country, Milton fought his civil war with words arguing vociferously against the status quo. On January the 30th, 1649, King Charles I was executed. The Republicans had won. Oliver Cromwell took control, and he hired John Milton, whose revolutionary ideals and foreign language skills made him the perfect secretary for foreign tongues. Basically, Milton was in charge of an embryonic foreign office. But the nation's hearts and minds were not yet one. The new regime needed to exploit one of Milton's other gifts, the ability to write fiery, brilliant, polemical prose. And it was to take him to the very centre of political power as Oliver Cromwell's chief propagandist and effectively the new British government's spin doctor. Milton was 41. He'd always been a solo maverick. Now he was paid to spin for Britain. He even became a government censor at one point, exactly what he'd railed against in Areopagitica. In Westminster, reality bites. I'm just interested in the fact that he suddenly went from being um, a public idealist to someone who was then in the heart of power. What does that do to your ideals? People lose their evangelicism. They, they lose the ability to be able to paint a picture of a big picture mm. of where they're going, what they stand for. You, you struggle to ensure that you've got an anchor, that you're holding on to what it is that you came in to do. Why, why are you there? Yes. yes and I, yes. Did, was there a bit of that with Milton, that he'd like to be on the inside and the outside at the same time? Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. And we all have a bit of that in yes. us, you know. But, and I mean, I, I really don't want to draw the uh, parallels between you, you no, too strongly, but... No, I'm not, I'm not a Milton. But... <laughs> he's, as they say, he's no Milton. <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered how Milton would have felt as the, the Republican cause began to fail. You, you think you've got somewhere and there's a change. You know, the banks collapse or something yes. calamitous like that. And what you would have been arguing becomes meaningless in the, in the public view. And you get swept aside as, as his arguments were at the time. Yes. After 11 years of justifying the word of Cromwell to men, Milton wasn't just out of a job, 
he was persona non grata. The Republic was finished. The monarchy was restored under Charles II. Milton must have been wondering, had it all been worth it? In Paradise Lost, there's an enormous set-piece battle in heaven between God's side and Satan's forces, who revolt because God's created his son, the Messiah. But Milton seems to be telling another story here. Strange to us it seemed at first that angel should with angel war and in fierce hosting meet. Angel should with angel war. This is a civil war. Milton's absolutely clear about this. You get the parallel, you get the meaning. What he's describing is a civil war in heaven. But who is Cromwell and who is Charles? That's the problem. You can't tell which is which. Here's a description of Satan. Satan, with vast and haughty strides, advanced, came towering, armed in adamant and gold. He's, he's described there as someone very regal, uh, someone aspiring to kingly authority. Is Satan Charles? Is he, is he Charles? Or is Satan what Cromwell was like at the end of Cromwell's lane? Because Cromwell aspired to be like a king, didn't want to call himself a king, so was crowned Lord Protector. And then Satan, speaking to his troops, speaks almost a defense of liberty and freedom from authoritarian rule that, that, that is like a standard argument for, for republicanism. For orders and decrees jar not with liberty but well consist. Who can in reason then or right assume monarchy over such as live by right his equals? If in power and splendor less, in freedom equal. These are the arguments of the republican movement. In a parody of modern warfare, Satan and his crew invent gunpowder. And then the other side come up with a really unique weapon. For me, it gets, it gets, it reaches the point of absurdity when the good angels suddenly have an idea, they're gonna come up with a better weapon, hills. They're gonna go and run and pick up hills and mountains and drop them on Satan and his troops. Their arms away they threw and to the hills Light as the lightning glimpse they ran, they flew from their foundations loosening to and fro. They plucked the seated hills with all their load, rocks, water, woods, and by the shaggy tops, uplifting, bore them in their hands. Amaze, be sure, and terror seized the rebel host when coming towards them so dread they saw the bottom of the mountains upward turned. It's quite, quite ridiculous. It's a grand, magnificent, huge custard pie fight going on in the sky. It's all very entertaining, as I'm sure Milton meant it to be. But he makes this war so absurd that I actually find this part of the poem rather unsettling. He's almost questioning the whole point of war. Given that what he's been through and given the disillusionment he's felt, he's, he's in his head, he, he, he's almost coming at the poem saying, was all that just a complete waste of time from start to finish? Was the whole civil war, it doesn't matter which side you were on, was it just all pointless? When you read Paradise Lost, you start questioning everything. While he was writing it, Milton knew he'd lost his political battle, but he was also coming to terms with an inner tragedy, that he'd gone slowly, agonizingly blind. What happens when you, when, what happened to you when you lost your sight? Blindness forces you back into yourself. You do, in a very real sense, lose the world. I suppose what I missed most, if that's the right word, would be the printed page and the human face. Yes. Both of, both of those disappeared. Mm -hmm. And both of those were absolutely vital to Milton, weren't they? They were... Absolutely. And, and was your loss of sight, was it a, a sudden thing or no, was it... it was very a... gradual, like his. And that, in a way, makes it more desperate. My dream life became extremely vivid. I was alive in a wonderful world of colour and action at night. When I woke up, every time I woke up, I went blind again. But the face is very important, the loss of the face. You mentioned a poem he'd written about that. That's right, yes. He wrote this um, 
sonnet in memory of his second wife, Catherine, who died very, very suddenly, not long after uh, childbirth. Uh, sonnet 19. Methought I, it's methought I saw my late espoused saint. Methought I saw my late espoused saint brought to me like Alcestis from the grave, whom Jove's great son to her glad husband gave, rescued from death by force though pale and faint. Mine as whom washed from spot of childbed taint, purification in the old law did save, and such as yet once more I trust to have, full sight of her in heaven without restraint, came vested all in white, pure as her mind. Her face was veiled, yet to my fancied sight, love, sweetness, goodness in her person shined so clear, as in no face with more delight. But oh, as to embrace me she inclined, I waked, she fled, and day brought back my night. It's just that last line is so... I waked, she fled, and day brought back my night. It's just so monosyllabic and um, uh, sparse as well. It's so... And I remember what you were saying about... Every time I woke up, I was blind again. In Paradise Lost, Milton says he wants to tell us of things invisible to mortal sight. One of his greatest poetic revelations is the way he writes the fall itself, when Satan tempts Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the single thing God has forbidden her to do. And so we come to the moment of self. This is where the fall of man occurs. So saying, her rash hand in evil hour, forth reaching to the fruit, she plucked, she ate. That's it, that's it, that's the description. It's all over in, in what, two lines. Four words even, she plucked, she ate. Four monosyllables, she plucked, she ate, that's it. Milton, who's a great command of all the biblical stories and myths and great powers of rhetoric and language and great, great flowing monologues and soliloquies and great epic, it's all down to she plucked, she ate. And the, the, the sheer devilish bravery in, in attempting something so bold like that is, is absolutely gobsmacking. You know, if, if this was Hollywood film, there would be a, a slow motion move of the apple up to the mouth and great swelling orchestral climaxes and probably a close-up of the teeth and maybe a camera from inside the mouth watching the apple come closer and the great jaws shut. But no, she plucked, she ate. That's it. Work it out for yourself. That's all I'm going to say. She plucked, she ate. It's the most momentous moment in history, according to this poem and yet it's given and delivered in, in the, the barest, the barest of lines. She plucked, she ate. Great! Milton wants us to understand that Eve freely chooses to eat the apple. It's entirely her own responsibility. The narrative is gripping. When Eve comes to visit Adam, he can see what's happened. He knows she doesn't have to tell him. He can see that the, th the one thing he hoped wouldn't happen has happened. Adam, soon as he heard the fatal trespass done by Eve, amazed, astonished, stood and blank, while horror chill ran through his veins and all his joints relaxed. From his slack hand the garland wreathed for Eve down dropped and all the faded roses shed. Speechless he stood and pale, till thus at length, first to himself, he inward silence broke. It's the energy, the life has gone out of him. The sounds are sort of empty, down dropped, and all the faded roses shed. The, the rhyme slows down to a, a very, very stately, quiet, End, and then speechless he stood. After all the language and talk of speeches and rhetoric, speechless he stood. Then, just as suddenly as Eve ate the apple, so does Adam. For with thee certain, he says, my resolution is to die. They are the tragic couple. They fall, but they fall together, and their world changes forever. Out in the real world, John Milton was in grave danger. 
He was an unrepentant Republican who defended the beheading of Charles I. But now Charles II was on the throne, Milton was on the wrong side. He couldn't take any chances. Milton went into hiding. He let London conceal him. It really is a bit of a labyrinth here. Little lanes, little alleyways. Hopefully no one can see them. Here's Bartholomew Close. Well, hidden somewhere, somewhere in this area, up some dark little stairwell. Milton was bundled away by his friends. But seeing it for the first time does make you realise how frightening it must have felt to have been pushed away from your home and into somewhere strange. And inside, knowing that all that you'd fought for, all you'd written about, all that you'd worked for and believed had uh, been overturned. King Charles II issued a proclamation on August the 13th, 1660, declaring that many of Milton's pamphlets were tantamount to treason. He ordered them to be publicly burned. Milton wrote in Areopagitica that you might as well kill a man as kill a good book. And yet, now his works were being burnt outside the Old Bailey, and many of his associates were being put to death. Soon the new regime caught up with Milton, and they threw him in the Tower of London. He was a political prisoner. Milton was blind, far from his friends and family, trapped between four walls, with only his own thoughts for company. Can you imagine what must have been going through Milton's mind and personality being imprisoned? What, 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 what in, inside him, what, what would have been happening? Um, I think my experience of having spoken to prisoners, whether they're from Guantanamo or, or Northern Ireland, uh, is that they uh, often question things in a way that they'd never done so before. Uh, I think in Milton's uh, experience, it would have been something similar, um, and particularly because I think that when you're unable to express yourself to anybody other than the four walls around you, that makes you sharper. It makes you want to express more. It makes you want to do it through writing because you know that perhaps you can't say anything. Nobody's going to hear you, but your words will be written and recorded forever. And why perhaps the the, the result that he turns rather than to polemic or to to memoir, he, he turns to poetry. I remember the, the, uh, the prisoners from the Arab world in Guantanamo would write amazing poetry uh, there to express themselves. And I had been held in solitary confinement, so I didn't know until I met some of them near the end of my time in solitary that we had all come to the same conclusion, that poetry had been written in Guantanamo in English, in Arabic, in Pashto, in Uyghur, in Farsi, in Turkish, uh, and people had come to their own conclusions as to how they wanted to express themselves. And it seemed like that the common denominator was poetry. Released from the tower after a couple of months with no charges to face, the poetry finally flowed from Milton. He'd been thinking about Paradise Lost since his early 30s, now at 53, with an extraordinary series of life experiences behind him, Milton was at last able to focus on getting the poem out of his head and onto the page. Living a quiet life somewhere here on Bunhill Row, known then as Artillery Walk, that's exactly what he did. Milton claims that the words to Paradise Lost came to him as divine inspiration in the middle of the night, in his dreams. Now, whether that claim is true or not, we do know that Milton would rise very early in the morning with vast chunks of the poem already composed in his head. The problem was he was blind, and he would have to wait until a member of the family stirred or a friend came to call and ask them to write it down in the form of dictation. So it was a complex complex task, one that he had to absolutely focus all his attention on. And while all that was going on, another great drama came along. Plague was engulfing the city. The poet, his family and his precious manuscripts, the sum of his life's work, 
had to get out of town. The Miltons sought refuge here, Chalfont St Giles in deepest Buckinghamshire. It's no Stratford-upon-Avon, there isn't a Milton industry here. No Satan sausages, no Adam and Eve Toby mugs. But Chalfont St Giles is the hub of the very modest Milton tourist trade because it's home to the only house he lived in that's still standing. While Milton was here, he gave a copy of the Paradise Lost manuscript to his friend Thomas Elwood. A nervous moment for any author. Milton called for the first copy of Paradise Lost and handed it to Elwood. Uh -huh. And if you did, just uh, as we're talking about this, if uh -huh. you press the little button by the fireplace there... Yeah. He asked me how I liked it and what I thought of it, which I modestly but freely told him. Thou hast said much here of Paradise Lost, but what hast thou to say about Paradise Found? He made me no answer, but sat some time in a muse, then break off that discourse and fell upon another subject. A rude man. <laughs> <laughs> After all that work, I'm just amazed by the reaction, which is, you know, yes. to spend all that time yes. writing and say, what did you think? I, I quite agree. And somebody's saying, yeah. yeah, that's all very well, but yes. uh, have you got anything else? How about Paradise? <laughs> <laughs> How about the sequel? And, Mil and Milton just going, yes. right, OK, yes, yes, yes fine. Yes, and yes, I'm just yeah, up and going um, and writing it and coming back. With it. But if we're very I'd lucky be to have Yeah, 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 I'm absolutely. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so that all happened here. And that all happened here? Yeah, 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 yeah. in this very yeah. room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Milton had to wait two years between finishing the poem and actually publishing it because the Great Fire of London decimated the city's print trade. Paradise Lost finally came out in 1667 and it looked like this. I've never seen inside the first edition of uh, Paradise Lost. This is very, very exciting. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world. Look at that. This is great. But what you get is a sense, really, of how compact, in the end, the poem is. The publisher, Samuel Simmons, said to him, we've noticed it doesn't rhyme. And the thing... What was <laughs> rhyming couplets at the time Milton was writing was very popular. And he's been asked by his publisher to put in a justification for why it doesn't rhyme. So Milton writes a defence of uh, the fact that the poem doesn't rhyme. I say a defence, it's really just a big, very, very articulate yeah to all those who do use rhyme. Uh, rhyme being no necessary adjunct or true ornament of poem or good verse, in longer works especially, but the invention of a barbarous age to set off wretched matter and lay metre. Graced indeed, since by the use of some famous modern poets, carried away by custom, but much to their own vexation, hindrance and constraint to express many things otherwise, and for the most part worse than else they would have expressed them. So he's basically saying, sod rhyme, I don't need it. People who use rhyme are using it as an easy way out get around the fact that they can't push their creativity in other directions. It's very exciting. Sorry, I've started reading it now. That's which I, I imagine is bad television. Um, but I can't help myself, because <laughs> uh, I've got Milton's first edition in my hands. So I'm going to read it. Milton spent his final years completely absorbed in writing and thinking. He produced many more great works of poetry and prose in a short time. He died in November 1674, and he's buried here at St Giles Cripplegate, in the heart of London, the city in which he spent the vast part of his life. It's not much of a shrine, so I suppose the best way to remember Milton is by reading his words.
The ending of Paradise Lost is Milton's masterstroke. It's a beautifully simple piece of poetry about Adam and Eve as they're expelled from the Garden of Eden and walk out into the real world, our world. These are the closing lines of the poem, and just listen how everything goes, not pitiful, not subdued, but accepting and quite noble in how this couple take on their fate, accept their humanity, all that they've got left, and face the fact that this is what they have to deal with for the rest of their lives. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest and providence their guide. They, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden, took the solitary way. The epic religious verse of heaven and hell and war and battle and sin, that all disappears. What we're left with are these bare words. They, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden, took the solitary way. It's a very daring ending here for Milton to use because it's so intensely secular. There's no mention of God and angels in these last few lines. It's, it's all very earthy. It's an anticipation of the life Adam and Eve are going to lead without those fixed certainties of religion. There aren't going to be any more visits from angels. Instead, they have to make their own way out in the world. I think it's because in the end, Milton didn't want to justify the ways of God to men wanted to justify the ways of men to us. He wants to leave us with that final image of an intensely human couple. A couple who have to make their own choices and decisions. A couple who are fallible. The final effect of getting to the end of the poem is to want to go back to the beginning and read it all again. This is, I think, because Milton puts us in charge. At the end of the poem, he lays down his pen the florid language disappears, and he wants us, like Adam and Eve, to go out into the real world and to deal with it. I never did finish my PhD on Paradise Lost. Maybe that's because the poem defies any definitive interpretation. After everything that Milton went through, He's urging us to keep examining things, to keep celebrating our freedom to think for ourselves as sentient, fallen, human beings. If you want to be inspired, disturbed, confronted with your failings and reminded of your strength, and if you want to read what it feels like to love and to be free, then you have to, you simply have to, read Paradise Lost. And you can find out more about John Milton on our website. The BBC Poetry Season continues with Michael Wood on Beowulf tomorrow at nine on BBC Four. And Sheila Hancock ponders poetry in My Life in Verse on Friday at nine here on BBC Two. We're chatting to this week's loser next, though. In The Apprentice, you're fired. Coming up on Newsnight, Ethical Man goes to Texas, the most polluting state in America, and finds some surprising energy developments. And we have the latest on MPs' expenses when Roy Hattersley will be speaking out against the whole scandal. See you at 10.30. Oil. Water. Whoa. I'm doing an experiment. Got the honey in. <laughs> Pim pam ball. Go. Floating. Floating. Perfect. That was sink. Oh! It went. Float. <laughs>